Okay, so this is the last of the lectures I'm giving and uh, I'll be talking mostly about network formation today. So going back to the um, 1985 piece by Granovetter, uh, you recall that the point he was making was that uh, economics was, uh, had a very under-socialized notion of um, economic activity. And so what I want to talk about today is probably one of the key uh, conceptual advances in, in, in the last 20 years, which, which have to do with uh, social structure and, and economic activity. And this is the idea that social and economic networks are themselves shaped by, uh, by choice. And the idea that somehow social ties uh, there is an economics to it in the sense of resource allocation. Uh, there is a cost and benefit aspect to it. Uh, and uh, it, it's reasonable in many contexts to think about social networks as arising out of deliberate choice by individuals whether to maintain ties, to form ties, or to dissolve or delete ties. Now, when this, uh, when this work first started in the, uh, in, in the 80s, certainly in, in, in in economics in the 80s and, and 90s, we, were, we didn't have Facebook. So, you know, the thought that you delete ties and you propose ties, which now seems to be sort of, it's a little passe. Uh, everyone does it and we do it all the time. Every day I get proposals from, on LinkedIn with some, someone or the other wants to form links with you. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's in the nature of life. But, but I think it's good to keep in mind that 20 years ago, it was not actually uh, the sort of thing that you woke up, you know, when you had your morning coffee, you had to say no to ties that people wish to propose. Okay, not, certainly not in such a concrete form. Okay, okay having said that, uh, the point I want to get across, and it, you know, this is a very short lecture, so I won't have time to talk in any great detail, uh, but what I would like to get across is some of the excitement which comes uh, when you put together economics and uh, game theory and you put together a number of concepts from graph theory. Uh, so that's what really this whole field of network formation is. And that's what I, I'll try and give you an introduction to. So this slide gives you a very, very, uh, very selective uh, view of uh, some early work in in the economics literature on network formation and two fairly general models, one that I wrote with, with Bala in, in 2000 and another uh, that Matt Jackson and Asha Wolinsky have, which are complementary and they, depending on the application and the, and the problem you're studying, they, are, they can be used to study network formation. And what I'll do is um, uh, say a few words. I haven't really quite done it as, as systematically as I should have, but there is, of course, a big literature on network formation and graph formation, if you like, and in mathematics. There's also a big literature now in computer science, and so there's also some work in sociology, uh, and so it's a very lively field of work, and uh, there are different surveys of this which you can look up. Um, so let me move on to key elements of the economic approach to network formation. And uh, uh, the idea here is to keep it, on the one hand, fairly general and, and simple, and, and then I'll move into specific uh, models and specific uh, applications. So, so as I said, uh, a key element in the economic approach to network formation is, is the idea that linking is a deliberate decision. It's a choice variable. You choose to form links or you choose to maintain links, you choose to invest in links. And, uh, uh, and this, the, 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 the thought that this is a deliberate, it's a choice, um, comes with the idea that somehow uh, there are costs and benefits associated with it. And, and, and that leads to the second point, which is that when I form links with some people, there are externalities for other people. So if I start uh, forming, you know, if I start having a long telephone conversation uh, with, with someone, then it takes up this person's time, and he will not have much time left to talk with other people. 
which means that they won't be able to talk with him, or when they do talk to him, he's going to be rushed, and so the quality of their interaction is going to be affected. Now, this is something that I may or may not take into account, and that brings us to the idea of externality or spillovers. Now, this is a very old idea, and um, it, it, it goes back at least to, to Pigou, uh, the idea that you have these externalities whenever people do things, and uh, uh, this is going to be very much at the heart of uh, why I think it's an interesting problem, network formation, for economists to study and why we actually bring new things to the table relative to what physicists or, or computer scientists, but certainly relative to mathematicians. So what's going to happen is we're going to put together this choice problem, which will lead to optimization, and externalities, which will lead to uh, the whole issue of welfare and uh, design problems. So when we combine one and two, we get games of network formation or models of network formation. Uh, there's again, a, now there's a very large literature on network formation and um, there are very many different um, applications. Uh, so uh, I really won't have time to go through many of those things in an hour long lecture. So there is a fairly long list of applications discussed in the lecture uh, towards the end of the lecture, and so you may want to look through it, you know, at your own leisure. Okay, so when you start thinking of network formation, uh, writing down uh, a model of network formation, you have to ask, um, as we did last yesterday, um, how do the payoffs, uh, when people choose, make choices, how are the payoffs derived? So similarly here, in a, in a game of network formation, you're going to have choices about links and probably about other things, and then you will have a description of the payoffs that arise. And so uh, depending on the application you're thinking of, you will write down different kind of payoff models. And so we'll, we'll come to that. That's a key ingredient. Um, another key component of network formation models is the idea of who decides on the link, uh, who has the power to form links, and maybe who has the power to you know, to prevent others from forming links. Okay, so, uh, and as, as I said, there are two standard and simple ways of thinking about it. One is that I can form a link with you. Uh, this is the kind of thing we do on, when we form hyperlinks, uh, we, we do this all the time. Uh, or when we cite someone's work, it's a link that I create and I can just form it on my own. Uh, um, but there are many links which require both people to agree. So when, when we want to write a paper together, when we want to do some project together, normally both people have to agree to do it. And so this is the, the idea that the power to form a link is a bilateral uh, choice variable. You can't just force someone to work with you. Okay. And uh, um, the third ingredient is going to be when I form a link, how much do I know about you as in terms of what you're, uh, what you're going to bring to the table, but also um, what do I know about the network? So for instance, if I want to um, you know, form a research collaboration with you, it's important for me to know uh, what other research collaborations you have because that might give me more information. More ideas might come to you from all your collaborations and that's good for our collaboration. On the other hand, if you're very, very well connected, you may be very busy. And if I start collaborating with you, I may not have much time with you because you're very busy, which is, so for, for both those reasons, I might want to know about uh, the network you inhabit. Uh, moreover, I might make inferences about your quality or ability if I know that you're working with very, very, uh, with, with very diverse set of people, that might give me some information about your ability, your personality type. Whereas if you don't work with anyone at all, that might also give me some information about your type, if you like, about your ability or about your work ethic, etc. So there is a number of reasons why information is going to play a key role in, in thinking about network formation. Uh, so what's going to happen is that when you start writing down economic models of network formation, just as you do when you write down economic models of uh, games, uh, you have to be very careful in specifying the strategies and the information set and the beliefs. And so in some sense, there is a lot of um, 
uh, you know, there's a lot of paraphernalia that comes with writing down a model of network formation, and this becomes very um, becomes very um, striking when you compare the models that economists write to the models that, let's say, mathematicians write or the models that uh, physicists write, which have a very, very, very sparse, very basic, very simple structure. Uh, and there is no notion of payoffs. There is no notion of information that people have. And there is no notion of choice. So uh, the, we are going to see that uh, if you go to other disciplines, especially to physics, uh, those models of network formation are very powerful in describing what comes out and how you can measure those networks. Uh, but they have a very sparse, very, very, very parsimonious and, and very mechanical structure as to the motivation why links are created. So, so we're going to have, uh, I won't be talking much more about physics and, and other disciplines, but I just wanted to uh, give an overall view that the, this is one way of thinking about network formation, and there are many good reasons why we may want to do this, uh, but there are other ways of thinking about network formation, and they are also very successful, and there is, I think, a sense in which there are questions for which different approaches are more or less suitable, and so I think you have to, when you start thinking about a problem, it's good to bear in mind that it's not just the economic model, but there are other models and other approaches out there, and sometimes they may be more appropriate than an economic model, okay, depending on the question you're trying to study. Okay, the last slide here is, I have last point here that I haven't really talked about, is what happens when we form links? Is it a, is it a game? There's someone standing at the door. Do you want to come in? Yeah. So, uh, so you could have a non-transferable, what, what, what economists would call non-transferable utility, which is that when I form a link with you, in fact, uh, we can't transfer anything. Or you could have transfers and bargaining, and we decide on the split of the cake. And so there are different models one can think of, and. Uh, the, in fact, in the literature, there has been work on those things. Okay, so I'm going to spend the first half of the lecture talking about the simplest possible model of um, network formation, which is that I decide on the links I want to form, and um, um, it's like a Twitter link. You know, I form a link with you, and I can follow what you're doing, and if you are following some people and you're retweeting, I can also see what they are doing. Okay, that's the model. And I don't have to ask you if I want to follow you. Uh, I just follow you. Okay. And I can then follow you know, people you are following, and so there's a chain of people I could be following through you. Okay, so in that setting, there is a cost to forming a link. Uh, there is a cost to following people, of course, uh, keeping track of what they are doing. And uh, we want to think about this as a very simple uh, game, and so we're going to look for equilibrium, and I'll also talk a bit, time permitting, about the dynamics of networks. And uh, we are going to ask very familiar economic questions. Are these networks equal, heterogeneous, homogeneous? What do they look like, the networks? Are they efficient? Um, and, and those are the kind of things that uh, we, we want to talk about. So to make things a bit concrete, um, and this is the, this goes back to what I was saying yesterday, I think we're going to start, to, it, it just, it's very helpful to take a very specific uh, phenomenon or, or a set of phenomena which uh, there, are, there's a, there is you know, enough empirical uh, evidence on and, and start with that and ask uh, how can we account for it and, um, and it's a good way to think about why you want a model of network formation and once you have a model like that, uh, you have some mechanisms you identified. You will now take these mechanisms to the lab, and you try and make sure, you try and understand how well they work, and in what ways they should be modified, which leads to other models, new models. Okay, so that's going to be the strategy I want to uh, convey today, also. So this is uh, a, a very old. Uh, uh, this is a very old uh, idea, the law of the few. This is, I think, 
I don't know whether the term law of the few is very old, but, but the phenomenon is, is a very old one, probably uh, at, at least first mentioned in this classical work in sociology and communication uh, work that goes back to the 50s. Uh, the idea here was, and let me give you some background, the idea here was that in, in the United States, this is a time when television and radio uh, were becoming very, very, uh, you know, were diffusing widely and uh, were being very widely adopted. These are mass media. So the thought was that social networks, which were important in a pre-mass media world, were going to become much less important because people would just be reading the uh, newspapers, listening to the radio, watching the television, and that's going to define their behavior and uh, attitudes. So that's the background to this work, and, and essentially the, the, the reason why this work has become so, so it ha has become so well known is that they found that in spite of the mass media and the cheap access to mass media, uh, in fact, social networks and personal communication remain very important. Okay, so this is a study that they did, in, I think, somewhere in upstate New York, and uh, they found that. They, they, they surveyed small sized towns and they found that the size of the, the sample size was about 4,000 people. And what they found is that most of, the, most of the sample was not actually reading or following the news in any systematic way. When asked what, how did they make up their mind on voting or on buying things or on buying clothes or uh, on different political matters or economic matters, they basically said they talked to other people, and that's how they figured out what to do. And uh, so really what was happening was, uh, and this fraction of people was roughly 20% of the samples. Uh, they were the people who people were talking to, mostly. Okay. Uh, so the point that the study raised was maybe these people were very different. Maybe these people were particularly well-educated, maybe they were particularly uh, of a certain age group, or they were m maybe they were very wealthy, uh, so they had the time, you know, the leisure to talk to lots and lots of people. So one of the other key findings of the study was that the difference, the demographic and economic differences between these so-called influencers, this 20%, and the rest were quite minor. Okay, so it's not actually very straightforward to map uh, observable differences, um, economic and demographic differences, onto um, network differences, if you like, influence differences. Okay. You can imagine that from a marketing perspective or public health perspective, it would be great if influence in a network were very highly correlated and very easily identified with observable uh, demographic differences, for instance, uh, because then you can just target people based on observable demographic differences. So uh, th this, these observations, it turns out, have many other studies have been done over the years. And in different ways, they have uh, confirmed uh, aspects of these findings. So for instance, uh, uh, let me talk about another uh, more recent uh, communi community or social network. This is the uh, Java Forum. Uh, the Java Forum is an online community uh, of users who ask and respond to questions concerning Java. Okay. And so this is a study from 2007, so it's a very recent study. And again, they looked at 14,000 users, and they found that 55% of them, so more than 7,000 of them, only ask questions. They don't reply to any questions. And 13% uh, only provide answers. So they don't ask any questions, and 12% ask and, and reply to questions. So this is a little different quantitatively from the earlier study, but what I want to get across uh, here is the idea, again, that most of the people are, in fact, um, you know, relying on a few people, a very small subset of the population, for, um, for the information they are looking for. So here's a very quick summary. So there, there's a number of other uh, empirical studies which, have, which, which confirm some subset of these findings. So here's a summary of those uh, studies. Um, 
And this is what I refer to as the law of the few. We, we got this uh, very catchy uh, phrase from the book Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell, which if you, if you haven't read, you should certainly uh, take a look at. It's a very easy to read book. And, um, but, uh, anyway, so, so this is the summary. A majority of people don't get, basically don't do any direct information acquisition. They get information from a small subset of the group. Uh, we call them the influencers. Uh, following the long uh, history of this word, uh, there are minor differences between the observable economic and demographic characteristics of the influencers and the others. So the question I want to pose is, you can think of this problem as uh, a problem where people are deciding how much information to acquire, and they are also deciding whether not to acquire much information and just talk to other people. Okay, so in other words, you can think of this as a problem where on the one hand you're deciding um, you know, how much an action like information acquisition, on the other hand you're deciding how many links to create. So this is a very natural stepping, you know, it's, it's a very natural motivation to write down a model and ask, is it the case that if you wrote down a model, a natural simple model of which has these two components, you will get in, in, in the outcome, the equilibrium, something like the law of the few. Okay. And, and in particular, is it the case that if you had slight heterogeneity between the different actors, you can pin down exactly who the influencers will be? Okay. So that, that, those are the kinds of questions we want to ask. So I'm going to very quickly sketch uh, a model that uh, is taken from a paper I wrote with, with Andrea Gagliotti a few years ago, and this is the, the idea of the model. We are going to, uh, we have a model where you have two uh, choices. You can buy information, and each unit of information costs C, uh, and you can form ties, bilateral ties with others, so if uh, if others have bought information, I can form a tie with them, uh, and the tie is costly, so the tie costs K, and I can form a tie with someone and get the information they have bought. Uh, the key assumption in this model is information bought by different, uh, by different people is a substitute, so this is very much like the model I went through yesterday on public, local public goods, and uh, you can do the same ex exercise uh, with instead of information being substitutes, you can do the same exercise where information is complementary. Okay. Do, do you want to come in and sit? <laughs> you want to keep standing? No, it's, I mean, it's, it's going to go on for an hour. <laughs> okay. so, so the idea here is, so you'll remember from the lecture last yesterday that we had a public good problem on networks which had, and maybe I should just pull this down to remind you. Um, early on, I put up a public goods. And I'm just using that model. Okay, this is the model we had yesterday. And what I've done is I've added another decision variable, decision choice variable. This is the number of links you create and uh, times a cost k. Okay, that's all I've done. So I'm building on that. Um, I'm building on that model, and I'm also building on an earlier paper that 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 I, I had, which is that the links here are unilateral. I can just create a link if I want to form a link with someone. I can create the link, and I can just pay a cost and do it. And I don't have to ask the permission of this person to create the link. Okay, so that's the. Um, uh, Okay, and, and, and as, because it's a substitute case, F is increasing and concave. Now, I could, as I said, I could write down a model with complements, so instead of having this being concave, for instance, I could have this being convex, and I could run this model, and in fact, more recently, um, I, I think there's at least one person in the audience here, Timo Hiller, he has a paper which has that, exactly that structure, and uh, there's a thought, former student of mine who's also done a similar paper. Uh, so one could do exactly the same exercise with the different kinds of information goods. Okay. But this is the 
Um, so what I want to emphasize here is that I've taken a model of public goods where the network is fixed to a setting where the network itself is uh, an endogenous variable. Okay, and it can be done in a very simple way. Uh, as you can see, I've just added a decision variable and, uh, you know, and, and that's how it is. Now, I have introduced this in a very, very um, mechanical way. Uh, you know, it's uh, additively separable. Uh, I could do it in a much richer way. I could make them, in fact, uh, you know, uh, interact in more interesting ways. Uh, and, and indeed, I think one might think that in many settings they do. So uh, there is, I think, certainly scope for a much more ambitious theoretical study of this sort of a problem. Uh, we know what happens. I'm going to talk about what happens in this particular model. But as you can see, it's a very, very specific model. And it has the, uh, it has the virtue of being parsimonious, but because it's so specific, we don't really know what properties of this model are specific to this model and, uh, and to the very specific um, mathematical structure here and which properties, in fact, are, are, uh, you know, are general. Okay. And so the work that Timo has done and my, uh, my, my student, uh, Oliver Bates, suggests that, in fact, many of these, some of the results I'm going to talk about will also obtain in a setting with complements. Okay, but, uh, okay, so what's the main finding? Yes. How do you think about A, which is continuously free? Yes, it's a continuous variable. So let me just go back. It's exactly as in the model yesterday. It's a continuous variable, and uh, links are, of course, a discrete variable. Okay. Then A is information. That's right, yes. So it's like, you know, um, you know, I want to find out, for instance, yesterday, Rachel was asking about fish and chips. And so I want to get, I draw samples, you know, from some distribution. And the more I draw, the more I learn. Uh, but the more I draw, the marginal returns for drawing more samples keep falling. Okay, so that's a very simple example. We're all trying to learn about fish and chips restaurants in Cambridge. I mean, it's not quite true, but, you know, maybe we are. And uh, then, you know, you would have that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the theorem here, uh, it turns out this is a very tractable model, and you can get uh, a very uh, nice characterization of equilibrium. So what happens in this model, uh, let me just remind you, uh, a feature of this model is that there is this Um, there is this uh, condition, f prime of x is equal to c, so I'm going to define this x. So we, we will keep this thing in mind. It was also present in the model I talked about yesterday. Okay, okay so what's going to happen in, this, in, in equilibrium in this model is um, it's not mentioned here, but a key feature of the uh, and it's a good way to think about what's really happening in the rest of the theorem, is what happens is that independent of the size of the population, in equilibrium, society acquires exactly S hat information. Okay. And so now, if once we keep this in mind, so let me just write it down, and then I'll just work through the arguments um, the, the proof of that result. Okay, so remember that you have this S hat uh, with the property that uh, it equates the marginal returns to the marginal costs. Okay. So I'm going to argue, and uh, I'll say a few words about why that's going to be true, uh, but I'm going to argue the, the key step is that the total information acquired in equilibrium so was it A? If I just sum across A is going to be equal to s hat. 
And this is independent of um, n. OK, so let's just build on that observation. So remember, we talked about this yesterday briefly. So in any equilibrium of this model, it must be true that any person you pick must be getting at least s hat from himself and his neighbors. Because if he weren't, then he could buy some information uh, and he would, you know, he, would, he would gain because the marginal returns would be strictly larger than c. So it must be true that if you looked at any equilibrium, everyone must be getting at least s hat. Okay, now if I have this property that in fact the whole society gets s hat, then it must be the case that everyone in the society must be linked to everyone else who is acquiring information. Because otherwise they wouldn't be getting s hat. So one simple case where this happens is that I actually collect s hat myself. And everyone else just forms a link with me. OK. So that's an equilibrium. Because once everybody is collecting no information, I must collect s hat. OK, that's the logic of the model yesterday. On the other hand, if the cost of linking, which is k, is smaller than the cost of, that's a hypothesis of the theorem which I have left out, the, the cost of collecting s hat is c s hat. And if this is larger than k, which is the cost of linking, then it's better for me to link with you if you're collecting s hat rather than you know, try and acquire information myself. Okay. Now, so, so that's the easy part. Okay. So if you believe me, and I won't go into the details of why this must be true, uh, you can read the paper for the details. But once you take this as a starting point, a lot of things then follow. Okay. So in particular, it could be the case that Many people are collecting information. Okay, but if many people are collecting information, it must be the case that each of these people who's collecting information must be connected with everyone else who's collecting information because together they must be getting at least s hat, and that's the total information. So that immediately implies that everyone who's collecting information must be forming a clique. In other words, they must be fully connected amongst themselves. Okay, yes. Yes, I'm going to come to that. Yeah. Okay. But, but at the moment, the costs are all the same. Yes. So uh, what happens then is that um, I've persuaded you that if s hat is the total amount of information collected in society, and if many people are collecting information, all of them must be fully linked. There is a complement set of people who are not collecting information. Of course, I'm not going to, if I'm not collecting any information, I don't want to link with someone else who's not collecting any information. That's a waste of linking costs. But I will, I will connect with everyone who is linking, who is buying information, because I must be getting at least s hat. For me not to be buying any information, it must be the case that I'm getting s hat from the people who are buying information. Okay. So that's basically the, um, so the final step is uh, this bit here. So this is the bit where peripheral players who buy no information must connect to all the core players. And the last bit, which is a key part of this law of the few, is that the fraction of core players, so these are the people who are buying information, is very small in a large society. So why is this the case? Well, this is true because if I'm going to connect to you, it must be the case that whatever information you are um, buying, okay, you're buying some information um, AI, for me to connect to you, it must be the case that the cost of buying this information personally must be larger than the connecting to you. Because otherwise, I would not connect to you and buy the information myself. Okay. So this, in turn, means that this actually sets a lower bound on AI. It tells me that AI must be at least as big as k by c. Okay. So, uh, so I know now that. Everyone in this population who's buying information must be buying at least AI. Uh, why? Because I'm linking with each of these people. 
but the total information collected is s hat. So that means the number of people buying information must be bounded above. Okay, and I've not used n anywhere out here. Uh, and so what it means is the number of people who are collecting buying information is bounded above, and that's independent of the uh, number of people in this population. And therefore, the fraction of people who buy information will be falling and will become negligible in a large society. So that's basically the, the logic. Uh, okay, so this is a set of pictures which which uh, summarize, you know, this, this is a model with a different number of hub players. And what you're having is you're having three hubs. You see that they are fully linked up amongst themselves. And here you just have a single hub who's collecting S hat, and everyone's linking with, with the single player. OK. So let me just pause, and I'll come back to this cost heterogeneity point. Yes. Yes, there are multiple equilibria with a number of different hub players. Yes. And we're not seeing this disaggregation. Yes, so um, notice that what I've done here is I have given you, uh, in fact, the details are in, in the paper, but what this is really formally, what this is saying is that the fraction of core players becomes negligible. So in fact, it goes to zero mm -hmm. as n gets large um, in every equilibrium. Okay. So, so so that's the form of the result. Now, if you want to talk about, if you like, equilibrium selection, uh, one way to do this is, well, so we have, I'm going to talk about experiments in a moment. But before I do that, one way to do a little bit of equilibrium selection is to introduce some heterogeneity here. Okay. So you might imagine, and this goes back to the point um, here, this is a very robust finding, by the way. Um, a, a number of different studies have shown this, that the people who are uh, the influencers are slightly different. Okay. So they could be, for, for instance, they, they are more often women than men, for instance. They are typically not very highly educated, but they are reasonably well educated. So they are somewhere in the middle, if you like. Uh, but the differences are, they are, uh, I think quantitatively they are not large, but they are significant. So that's the way I would summarize the, the literature. So partly motivated by this, one could do the following. One could say that for some people, this cost is smaller than for others. Okay, so some people just like buying information uh, more than other people. Alternatively, you could say that some people like linking more than other people. Okay. So in the paper, we, we studied the case of cost heterogeneity. And it's, it turned out, uh, it was quite unexpected, uh, it turned out that when you have cost heterogeneity, uh, you can have two kinds of outcomes. Um, very roughly speaking, one outcome would be corresponding to the case where you have the low-cost guy. Let's say there are, uh, 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 there are some low-cost guys. So one of the low-cost guy is going to be the center there. And because he's a low-cost guy, he will acquire more information than what the high-cost guys. You see, the S hat for the low-cost guys is going to be larger than the S hat for the high-cost guys. So if I'm a high-cost person here, and I'm linked to a low-cost guy, my S hat is, is actually smaller than his S hat. So when he collects, let's say, S hat low, I'm more than content. I'm not going to buy any more information. So that's going to be the kind of outcome you'll see. You will have all these. Some, possibly some low-cost guys linked with this hub, who's a low-cost guy. And all the other high-cost guys will be happy to link with him as well. So that would be one kind of outcome. Uh, the other kind of outcome that can happen, uh, and that only happens if you have a singleton low-cost guy, uh, is that he, he, he's a central player, but he doesn't collect everything. All the others collect a little bit of information, uh, such that together, they, they, they collect enough information to satisfy this guy. Okay. But most of the information is bought by the central guy. Okay. So what happens, in, in just to summarize this discussion, is at a high level, if you have a little bit of heterogeneity, um, 
what it does is this network formation story, what it does is that it, it basically uh, leads to a concentration of information acquisition amongst just the low cost guys. Okay, so the simplest case is one where there's one low cost guy and essentially the low cost guy becomes the hub for sure. He either collects all information or he collects most of the information. Those are the two equilibria. Okay, so a little bit of heterogeneity is enough to uh, really pin down the identity of the influencers. Okay, so this is nice, it's almost a little too nice, but it's, it's, it's really nice and it fits in with the uh, empirical work that people have, you know, this idea that um, a bit of heterogeneity is, is enough to uh, get a lot of uh, um, salience in these network models. Okay, so let me sort of uh, uh, walk you through that. So, so let's think of an example where uh, there are two guys who are low cost, right? Maybe that's, is that what you had in mind or were you thinking about no, the, the basic model? Yes, the right, but that is allowed. So, so, so but that is, that's an equilibrium. You know, so. But okay, now I was saying yes. that in all of them, Oh yes, because linking is unilateral here. Yes, so my question is, right. is it possible to have an equilibrium which you have, you are linked to me and you are also, so I'm linked, I'm observing you and you are observing me? Or? Okay, so I, I think I didn't clarify the model here. So the model here is, has a following flavor. When I link to you, I get your information, but you also get my information. Yeah, sorry, I should have clarified this. So having said that, you can of course change the linking model and have bilateral model linking, okay? And so what's gonna happen in a bilateral linking model is of course you can't get, uh, you know, these kinds of stark uh, results because, you know, the central guy will never pay a cost to link with someone who is not acquiring any information, okay? So, so number of observations. So let's go back to the payoff statement and the, okay, so, So notice that in this model, uh, when I form a link with you, I pay K, okay? But you don't get anything in this model as things stand. There is no notion of incoming links. Uh, but I could add that here. I could say plus K times number of links formed by other people with me, okay? Notice that that has nothing to do with me. It's not a choice variable for me. Uh, so in fact, it just washes out. Okay, so, so this is a model which actually allows that, and I, when I go to the experiments, you will see that this is going to play a major role. Uh, the analysis of the model is, is actually independent of whether I get money when you form a link with me or not. In this statement, in this particular formulation, I don't get any money, but I could actually easily do, add some money, okay? It's not going to affect the equilibrium analysis uh, as things stand, uh, but, you know, it's, um, um, but it's substantively actually quite interesting. And you will see in the experiment, it makes a big difference. Okay, so, so it's kind of interesting. Um, okay, so the other point I think you are making is that can you have a number of low cost guys and can they be constituting the hub? And I think yes, that's true. If you have a number of low cost guys, they could together be doing this S hat high and uh, all the low cost high cost guys and just link with them. Okay, so let me just pause and ask you if there are any questions on this. Um, yes.
Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't thought about that model, but, yeah, so I think the idea of in introducing transfers, um, and I'll talk about it in, in a moment when I do the experiment, uh, but the, I don't see there is a, I don't think there's a formal analysis of a situation where, um, I think you're thinking of a capacity problem, yes. yes. Yeah, we, I, I would worry about it slightly because I think it may not be as smooth as this sort of a model because of this capacity, but, yeah. Yes. Is this model is formed uh, sequentially or sequentially? Yes, so um, the theorem here and the model here is, is all actually, everything is simultaneous. Okay, so the linking, the information acquisition is all taking place at the same time. Um, in the paper, there is actually discussion of what would happen if you did things sequentially. Uh, but uh, I think I'll, I'll leave it. I mean, I don't want to get into the details because it's, uh, yeah, uh, uh, let me leave it at that. In the paper, there is a long discussion on that. Yes, there was another question. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you have in mind? Bad information? Well, so um, the idea that it may be easier to acquire um, information that's farther from the truth versus um, uh -huh. something that is closer to the truth. Um, this is more like an effort problem, you mean? A bit, yeah. So if you put in a lot of effort, your information is more accurate. And if you have, if you put in very little effort, then you, you have information where it's noisy. Right. Um, and so there's signals, is it? Um, yeah, and you're sharing I, signals. Uh, I, I don't even really think of it that much, but just the, the idea that maybe, um, so for instance, uh, you're thinking about these uh, central information acquirers as like news agencies or something like that. Um, then how would you think about So I think, I think it's a fascinating question. I, I'm wondering to what extent, so what's going on in this model is very reduced form. I either acquire information, uh, you know, I acquire, I can buy more or less information. So it's, uh, it's very reduced form and it adds, uh, you can see that when you wrote down, if you wrote down uh, more general information, sample size sort of a story or, you know, um, you could get, you could pay more and then you get a more accurate signal, that sort of story. Um, I'm trying to ask myself if it's going to, um, it's going to be a smoother model than this, uh, but I'm, Yeah, I, I don't see. Um, I don't see a major. Um, I'm trying to see what is there a sense in which there's going to be something quite sharply different from what this model is doing, and I'm not seeing that clearly. Although there may be something, uh, I should add. I think Matt Leister, you have a paper, right, which actually tries to do exactly those kinds, relate very closely related to those. Yeah, you're going to have a poster. Yeah. Okay, so so you should ask Matt and uh, and uh, do you, do you want to say a few words? So 
right. There's another question here, right? No? Okay. So, uh, I mean, the question you're asking, I should say there is a literature uh, which looks at a related problem, which I think is quite an interesting uh, applied problem. And the problem is the following. Uh, supposing I, um, I'm a web page, which I have a blog or whatever, you know, I'm, and, and I'm actually, I want people to link to me. Okay. So uh, the way I want, you know, for, for different reasons, I mean, it could be for advertising reasons, but it could also be because I just crave attention. Uh, as you'll see in a moment that that seems to be an important factor, but, but anyway, so um, the, 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 the practical problem or the applied problem is, should I link to people who have good information content web pages? Uh, the idea being that on the one hand, if I link with them, you know, people who link to me might discover, hey, you know, I'm a boring guy and they should just go to this other link, right, this other web page. On the other hand, uh, there is this thing that they will want to link to me because I actually give them a sense of the world. You know, I give them a sense of the lay of the land. If I'm linked to lots and lots of different, you know, I summarize information very well, uh, there's a sense in which they would want to come to me rather than go to all these different sites because I'm the sort of place where they can actually figure out what the world looks like, okay? The, I have seen some models of that. It's a bit different from the problem you're raising, but it is sort of related about, you know, it, it, it's a nice practical applied problem and it is related to the questions here. Um, so one of the things that's interesting in these um, uh, studies, you know, most of them have been done by marketing people and um, sociologists and, and so on, communications um, uh, academics, is, is this idea that uh, people who are um, influencers often also know who are the other people who you can talk to, you know, who, who can help you somehow. Uh, who, who are the right people to talk to. Now, and, and they are often actually quite forthcoming with that information. So it's very, it's analogous to this online problem. Uh, and, and those kinds of questions, I don't think we have a good model. There are a number of papers and some of them are actually quite, quite influential papers, but uh, we don't really have a nice model of what's happening there. Uh, so I just wanted to raise that as a interesting problem which I think can build on this sort of uh, approach, and uh, and I think I think it's quite an open problem. Okay. So uh, and and if, as a sort of you're a blogger or you're a, running a company, you know, on, which makes money from advertising, it's a perfectly it is an important question whether you should link with other sites and should you charge you know for for linking. Okay, so so this is sort of. Uh, I was not planning to talk in, in any detail about this, but I just wanted to flag this literature, this big area and, and actually very uh, lucrative area, which has to do with the industrial organization of the web. And there are auctions problems, but also there are all these networky problems which have to do with uh, access pricing and advertising and, and where net, these games of network formation can help, I think, think about those things. Um, those industrial organization issues. Okay. okay, so I think there was some comments about welfare. As you can imagine, um, if you think of the single hub case, uh, this person is choosing S hat to maximize his personal utility. So he's doing his first order condition is given by this equation, but actually you can see that his marginal the, the social marginal returns are n times f prime s because they're uh, investing. He's, you know, this is a public good problem. And uh, more generally, you can show in this uh, model that the efficient outcome is for a single hub uh, because you thereby minimize the number of links, which are costly. But the hub, in turn, is going to underprovide. So uh, this is a good point of departure for the experiment. Okay, so there's a very nice experimental paper by Van Leeuwen, Offerman, and Scrum um, from uh, Amsterdam. And so what they do is the conductor, uh, so let me just step back and say a few words. So what we have done is I've given you a theory 
which goes back at least 50 years, uh, sorry, uh, empirical work, which goes back at least 50 years. Um, and I've given you a theoretical model which gives an account of how you can explain some of this. And uh, the way it goes about it is it, it exploits these economic mechanisms, okay, these substitutable goods, uh, the strategic interaction, and, and you know, that's the way this model works. And so what we want to do now is to ask if people were in a slightly artificial setting, a laboratory, and we ran this model, are they going to behave in line with the mechanisms of this model, the economic mechanisms of this model? And if they don't, are there systematic departures? Uh, and if, you know, what's the nature of those departures? And can we use those departures to feed back into thinking about what might be going on in the world and maybe thinking about richer models, okay, which will help account for what's happening in the world better? Because that's the, uh, that's the overall um, you know, plan of the thought that's behind these slides. Okay, so the experiment here is you have a group size effect, four versus eight. Uh, so, I mean, I should say at the very outset that four players to think about law of the few is, is, is a bit of a, you know, it's a bit absurd. So uh, right at the very outset, I should say that this is a setting, in fact, and this raises a more general question. Many of the interesting problems in networks have to do with large numbers. But these are small number game, you know, experiments. So there's actually a big space out there for those of you who are uh, ambitious to actually do large scale experiments. And the easiest way to do them is to do them online. So there is in fact a lot of interest now in building platforms to do online experiments with you know, several hundred subjects. And that's the kind of setting where a law of the few, it's a legitimate object of study. Right? Uh, but, but anyway, so, and, there are many games which, which one can take to that, where scaling might be important. And so I think that's, okay. So what happens in this experiment? And I should say this is a repeated version of this, uh, the static game. So there are going to be repeated game effects. So when you do four versus eight, the, the, the main finding is that the stage game Nash equilibrium is played infrequently. Okay, so it's not played uh, very often. Okay, so this is the basic model. Uh, remember, this is the model with that payoff specification I had. Then the second treatment they do is this one here. A fraction of the linking costs are transferred to the agent who receives a link. Okay, so uh, as I said, and uh, you'll have to take my word for it, but the paper uh, you know, develops this point, it actually makes no difference to the formal analysis of the model. In particular, the experiments uh, in the experimental design, the cost of linking is 20, of which 12 is transferred to the receiver of the link. Okay. Okay. Is, is this experiment clear? Okay. I haven't written down all the details, but basically it's a repeated game with, I think it's 20 rounds or something like that. And in each round, you're playing the static game that I described. Uh, now, just to go back, let me just uh, remind you that when I make a link with you, I pay k, but you get nothing. I argue that if I were to give you half of k, it would make no difference to the analysis. Okay. So that's the first point that we want to keep in mind, that as far as the theory is concerned, abstracting from the repeated structure of the game, nothing should change. Okay. And the point is that there's going to be a big impact. Okay. So what happens is, uh, in the repeated game, really what happens is that a lot, th a lot of things change with this transfer thing. Okay. Um, so in the repeated game, a player who invests a lot in earlier stages may be rewarded with links and transfers subsequently. Okay, because basically I, I'm, notice that when there are transfers to me, uh, there are returns to me. I'm actually playing a, uh, a contest game. I want to be the hub because when I am the hub, um, I pay for this public good, but I get all these links to me, and each of them gives me 12, which is a lot of money. Okay, so that's the uh, logic of this thing. And so, in fact, what you want is, as I said earlier, what you want is one hub, because that economizes on linking costs. And in a, in a game where transfers are being made, um, people are going to fight to be the hub. And how do you fight to be the hub? You fight by buying lots of information and making yourself attractive. Okay? 
And indeed, in the repeated game subgame perfect equilibrium, you actually have these kinds of equilibria, where there is a hub okay, who buys a lot of information, and people link to him for many, many stages to, till towards the end, of course, he, he, he stops. Okay. okay, so that's the uh, very sort of informal discussion of what really happens in this repeated game. So what are the findings in the, in the experiment? Well, subjects play a stage game equilibrium in 75% of the cases in the group size four. So as far as the theory is concerned, nothing should have changed. But in fact, in the lab, behavior is transformed. Earlier it was 20%, now it's 75%. Okay. And so, so something is going on, which uh, really we, we don't have a very good explanation for. And secondly, in the uh, group eight exercise, group eight treatment, um, in fact, you have this hub, single hub emerging in 75% of the cases. So that's sort of surprising because uh, when you didn't have transfers, nobody was particularly keen actually to be in the hub. Now that you have transfers, uh, you, you have the equilibrium and in larger group sizes, in fact, you have a single hub, okay? Not only that, but the single hub actually makes investments which are much larger than S hat. Okay, he actually makes investments close to um, the first best. And the idea is very simple. The idea is I want to actually uh, be the hub. And the way I want to beat you up, you know, beat you to become the hub, is that I want to invest a lot. Okay, and I'm going to get the returns through these transfers. Okay, so that's the logic of this experiment. So, um, okay. Uh, so the core agent chooses in line with stage game prediction in the group four, but chooses much in excess. In fact, chooses very close to the first best in, in group eight. So. And so, uh, and they show, the authors show that this is actually consistent with the equilibrium of the repeated game. Okay. So let me summarize. In, in the basic game, the hub player earns less than spokes. So there is no point in being the hub you're providing all these public goods. So subjects don't play the star network. Um, they actually are all over the place. Uh, they play equilibrium only 20% of the time. In the new game with transfers, the hub player, there's a lot of hubbing. Uh, people emerge as hubs, uh, as, as it says out there. Uh, they earn more than the spokes, and they are happy to be the hub. Transfers facilitate the emergence of a stable star hub spoke network and induce large investments uh, which approximate first best outcomes. Okay, so what, what we get from this is on the one hand, we, we find that the theory uh, as it was is, is actually um, rejected by the experiment. Uh, but when you add transfers, the theory still works, but now the outcome is very different. So that raises questions about what is happening, what is not being captured by the theory, formal description of the theory. And uh, secondly, when you have repeated games and you want to be a hub, there are transfers of different kinds. This transfer could be a social status transfer or it could be a monetary transfer. Uh, you see um, very quickly the emergence of um, these influencers and uh, that leads you to develop a new repeated game model uh, where um, you know, which goes beyond the original model um, to account for this. So, okay. So maybe I should ask if there are questions about this. Yes. The linking cost is constant. Yes, the linking costs are constant. Oh. So this is the idea that if I buy a lot of information, then I ask you for more. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't seen a model like that, although I think it's a very nice idea that if I, for, for example, if I have a lot of links, there may be more congestion. So you might, uh, you know, that kind of, a, that idea is very much, uh, very, very prominent in this literature, the idea of congestion. Uh, 
but I haven't seen, uh, no, I've not seen a model where the linking costs are somehow proportional to what, you know, maybe how much information you're getting. Um, no, so it's really, I mean, I think it's, as far as I know, it's an open problem. There was another question. Yes. Yes, yeah, so uh, there has been some work on this. Um, one way to think about this in a way reduced form is, way is to think about this as a bilateral linking problem. Okay. And... Uh, And, and I think Timo has some work o on that, you know, when you have to both pay to link. Um, now, you can see that in a game of complements, um, even the people who are acquiring very little information will acquire some information because, because they're connected to other people who are acquiring lots of information. There are returns, very high returns from acquiring information. So, so the, the flavor of the complements case is more uh, in line, you know, uh, and since I'm acquiring some information, you're happy maybe to link with me if your costs of linking are not high. Okay. Uh, but, but I don't think there's a nice model of bargaining, but maybe Timo wants to add something to this. Um, yeah. It's not the bargaining, but there's something with, with the value constant, that you take the indirect liquidity constant, so I don't have to explain it directly. Take that. Yes. So I should say that uh, there is a quite a uh, sophisticated literature on bargaining in networks. And um, I would just urge you maybe to uh, read s some work, uh, maybe some recent papers by Mihai Manya. He has a whole set of papers on bargaining in networks uh, that should give you a good sense of the literature. There's, it's an old literature. It goes back 15 years, at least. And, um, but it's quite a, uh, you know, bargaining theory itself is, is quite a uh, rich body of work. And when you bring that into a network setting, um, it quickly becomes very um, delicate and, and, and actually quite, um, quite hard. So uh, there is a, what is already, I think, quite... Um, detailed compared to models in maths and physics becomes even, you know, a, a much, much, much more detailed and much more micro-founded, if you like. So uh, let me just take a step back and say there is a major modeling tension in this field. Uh, and you feel that when you go to uh, networks conferences, not economics conferences, uh, because you see uh, a lot of the work is interested in large data sets. Uh, big data sets on. And those kinds of big data sets, when you want to do studies with those, typically uh, you work with models that are very, very parsimonious. You know, uh, they are not parsimonious in the sense of models that I'm talking about. They're really very, very much, much more parsimonious. They're much more mechanical. There's no choice behavior. There's no information. There's no beliefs. And uh, those models uh, go a long way in, in talking I think saying interesting things about the data, interesting things about phenomena that we care about. What we are doing here is already very, very micro and, and you know, extremely intricate. Uh, and you can see that we can say quite a bit about particular problems, uh, but um, it's, if you take a step back, you can see that these arguments, uh, for example, these uh, kinds of network results, rely a great deal on a lot of information assumptions, that I know everything about the network, I know how much you're acquiring. You know, I'm imposing a lot of machinery to, to get these results. And it's not clear that in large 
network settings, how plausible these assumptions are. Uh, and to the extent that you think that the world, in the, the, what's happening in the world is interesting when it's happening on Facebook, you know, you're thinking about millions and millions of people and you know, very large networks or Twitter. And it's, so that's another reason why I think scaling up these experiments, scaling up these models, and seeing how far they work uh, is, is, a, is a first order problem at the moment. Um, uh, so, so I think this is not just true. I mean, you can do these little classroom, classroom PRFX exercises, you know, uh, and for that sort of thing, probably these models are, you know, and these kinds of models and this approach is reasonable. But I think when you're doing large network analysis, uh, then you may want to ask whether this is already too, too minute, too detailed. Uh, and you may want to have a more parsimonious approach uh, to choice and modeling. Uh, so there's a key modeling tension here. And if you want to work on networks, you will see that it's a defining feature of the field. Uh, so what I'm doing here is actually, uh, I think, very, very detailed. It's essentially game theory in networks. So all the baggage of game theory is being brought on, onto networks. And it's, uh, it has its attractions. Uh, but there's a tension here, and, and uh, if you, yeah, it's a, it's a big modeling tension. Okay, so let me, uh, I'll talk very briefly. Uh, I have about 10 minutes, so um, you will have all these slides, so you can read them at your leisure, and uh, so I'm going to skip uh, this application and pairwise this thing because I want to talk a bit about open problems in, uh, and applications more generally. Okay. So the structure of this part of the presentation was the same, starting with a number of empirical patterns, having a model and then doing an experiment uh, and then asking what do we learn about the theory from the experiment. Uh, okay. Okay, so so just a quick summary. Uh, so what I've done is I started with some empirical patterns, had a model, uh, very simple models, and they have very sharp predictions. We take them to the lab, we look at uh, uh, what happens. We get sometimes, you know. Uh, results that are in line with the theory, but often we need to go back to the drawing board and do new models to explain and understand the data that comes out from the lab. So that is true in this uh, law of the few experiment, and uh, this is also true in, in the paper I presented yesterday on trading in networks. With those experimental findings, we went back to the drawing board and have a new theoretical model uh, to understand the data better. Um, Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about applications. And it's going to be a very quick tour uh, through these applications, but I just wanted to give you a f flavor of the very wide variety of work that's uh, going on. Um, combining network formation with a variety of practical applied problems. So I've already talked about firm networks in, in the lectures and I'll leave them with you, there is a very nice um, body of work on co-authorship networks, uh, both theory and empirics. Um, there is a very large literature in marketing on viral marketing, and a uh, number of people have uh, written papers on it. There's a very nice recent paper by Arthur Campbell in the American Economic Review, which you may want to look at. Uh, there is a very uh, big literature on labor um, in labor economics on, on, on social networks, um, some of the most influential work on labor markets and networks was done actually in the 50s and 60s. Uh, there is, of course, this very famous work by Mark Ranavetter, which first brought out the notion of strong links and weak links and the strength of weak ties. Uh, that was really done as part of his PhD thesis in the 60s, late 60s. So... Um, more recently, there have been a number of attempts to introduce social networks um, into labor markets, and um, both fixed network models, but also network formation models. This paper by Galiotti and Merlino in the 
National Economic Review is, has endogenous network formation uh, in a labor market setting, uh, and it, it's a very nice paper. There is, uh, this slide has a number of other uh, applications. Let me talk a bit about the financial contagion and resilience problems, and uh, this is something that I've been working on recently, and uh, there's a lot of uh, interest in this problem on contagion and, um, and resilience of networks. So, so I have about five minutes, uh, including questions. So let me spend a few minutes um, talking about this. So, so let me take a step back from the slide first. So as I said, uh, the idea of contagion is a problem very simply of the following form, that there are these interconnected systems. These could be physical, social systems, and we could, we could be looking at contagion like diseases. Uh, so, um, you know, it could be AIDS or it could be the flu, which is passing through contact. And that's a very widely, you know, it's a very uh, deep literature. It's, it's a big social problem. It's a big economic problem. Um, you could think of cyber um, security. It has a, really the same structure. We are interacting online and we download stuff. Some of it is interesting and good. Some of it is interesting and probably has viruses and worms and they may infect our computer and then they may travel from our computer to other computers when we communicate with them. Okay, they may capture our computer and extract private information and, and, and so on. So in some sense at a at a high level, at an abstract level, these models uh, are quite similar. Okay. Uh, more generally, this idea that shocks might percolate through a system is very much uh, at the heart of the recent work on financial contagion. Our bank, which is a bad investment shock, let's say, uh, goes under and then pulls many other banks under and you know, can have... So the big question here is whether the networks can amplify or dampen the shocks. And the uh, really uh, interesting feature of these networks is that often they have been created, in fact, to diversify risk, okay, uh, or to diversify liquidity flows, and uh, uh, to smoothen liquidity flows. So they have been created, in fact, to somehow diversify, to m reduce risk. But they could become the vehicles for uh, large shocks uh, percolating and destroying a system. Okay, so, so there's this trade-off. And so there's been work in, in all these applications uh, over the last 10 years or so. Uh, in epidemiology, there's been a lot of interest in, in networks. A lot of that work has been done in physics um, and, and statistical physics. In financial contagion, there's been a lot of recent work. Uh, there's some very nice papers which are mentioned in your slides. And in cybersecurity, there is just very little work, but it's sort of, uh, there's now a whole body of new papers uh, which are uh, combining epidemiological models and cybersecurity models. Um, and what I want to do is talk a little bit about this perspective of network formation. So what happens in, if you think about the problem, uh, you could think about it at different levels of uh, uh, decentralization. So you could imagine that I can actually design all your social networks and I can design also how about your investments. I can choose the investments you're going to make in security. So that's one planner problem, if you like. But I could also now think that, in fact, I can't design uh, you know, who you're going to interact with, but I can design what security is going to be installed on your computer, which is what happens in Cambridge, for instance. My computer in my office, I can't, they don't tell me who I can communicate with, but they basically install some security. And they don't ask me what security they install, and they try and, so that's one, a lower level, if you like, of, of control. Uh, you could have the reverse problem that someone can design the network uh, and individual nodes design how much security they're going to have. Okay. And finally, as in the banking context, banks are deciding the links. Who do they lend to? Who do they borrow from? Where do they invest? And so now you go down to a further level of decentralization where the network itself is being created by decentralized choice. Okay. And so what you can see is you, when you start asking questions about welfare, you can pose the question at different levels of decentralization. Uh, you can compare the first best with different levels of uh, choice. 
Okay. And the network itself becomes an object of choice, both for the planner, but also for these banks and these uh, uh, people, let's say, you know, and, and computer networks. Okay. So, I'm, so I just, I'm just sort of careful about the time. Um, and I think, let me just put up the last slide and leave it here. Uh, so one or two general observations I would like to make, they are really about, I think that because of the great interest in um, the subject of a lot of the network's work has become much more applied, much more empirical, uh, I have a feeling that some of some very large major theory questions have been ignored or not as well studied as should be. And I'm just listing some of them here. Uh, dynamic network formation, we really have those physics, maths type of models which are very mechanical and then we have these uh, very, uh, the models that I presented today and the literature surrounding that work. Uh, but really we don't have a proper uh, dynamic network formation model where I form links anticipating what will happen in the future and, and being strategic about that, which is the idea that many people have about strategic linking, that I form a link to preempt your linking. Right? So that sort of uh, idea has not really been explored. Um, network formation with large number of players, it brings in naturally dynamics, it brings in information issues, and we know very little about what happens in those network formation settings. Um, and finally, um, I think that we know a great deal about markets because we've been working on markets for forever. Uh, we know relatively little about networks, though we are learning more rapidly. Uh, but I think a lot of economic activity takes place when the two are together, uh, networks and markets. And there are very few models that combine and I think that this is a first order problem because you can't help feeling there is no such thing probably as a Chicago school, but if there was one, they would probably often say, well, you know, this is all very fine, but this is a small friction and in a competitive market, it would be dissolved. You know, somehow if there were rents to be made, these networks would be somehow dissolved. And more generally, it's not clear when networks will matter and when networks will not matter. To do that, it seems natural to write a model where markets are around. Standard models that we understand uh, should be introduced along with mo models and networks. And then you see the role of prices and the role of networks. Uh, and there is very, very, very little literature really on which poses this, to me, a fairly first order problem. If you take a labor market setting, you know, when should you expect uh, networks to matter, when should you expect search frictions to matter, uh, when should you expect, um, you know, different kinds of frictions to matter, and uh, what's the quantitative significance. To be able to get to that point, you need to have a model which allows these different things to be present together, okay. And, and so I, I would think that that's a very, very um, major uh, open uh, area for, for work. Okay, I'm going to leave you with this slide, and there are a few minutes for questions, and I'm happy to take questions. It's fine. So I think the issue here is that I think you could ask about questions about learning about the network. Um, and I was mentioning yesterday to someone, there's actually some interesting work about how do you learn about a network. And uh, there's now some very interesting econometric work about how do you make inferences about networks by when you have very limited information about networks. Uh, but 
maybe you have in mind a slightly different problem, which is that supposing I'm in some social context and I don't know a network, and I want to, f uh, and I don't know different people who are in around, that's the standard problem of incomplete information. But there's in addition this issue that the network itself is unknown to me. Um, how do I function in that environment? And uh, I think that's, um, I, my, my feeling is that's a very, it's a problem which is a very well-posed problem for, uh, for, for, for a theoretical model. How do you, uh, so recently, I mean, just to give you a sense of, uh, you know, I was actually really taken aback. Someone I know is in London, um, and this person was, is actually talking to a number of startup companies, uh, science startup companies. And uh, this person is supposed to be a mentor to the startup company CEOs. And uh, the, the, the task of this person is actually, so she, so she was sent a whole set of questions, uh, what, she, you know, what she should prepare for. And there were two kinds of questions. One was strategy questions. Uh, and, and in those strategy questions, half of the questions were about how do you network? You know, and what's the point of networking? Uh, and so I, I just couldn't believe that in this rather high pressure environment in London on a, on a startup day, where there are 20 rather busy CEOs of startups, they want to actually ask some, uh, you know, some economist, uh, how, do we, uh, how do we join networks? How do we understand networks? How do we form the right kind of networks? And uh, how do we make our network more attractive to people? How do we attract talent to join our network? And um, what are the right points of entry in a social network? Uh, so, um, I mean, this is just to give you a sense that what we are talking about at some level, you know, sounds uh, very theoretical and abstract. And um, I think it's becoming less and less so if you think about the online world. But still, I think business and, and strategy is, is very concerned, in fact, from a practical point of view. Uh, and so I was talking with this person, and, and this person said, well, you've been writing these models for 50 forever, you know. What have your models taught us, you know? So I, I was very tempted to take the Ariel Rubinstein point of view that I've written all these bargaining papers, but I know nothing about bargaining. And, and I've learned nothing about bargaining from writing these models. Uh, because I, I was suddenly posed, you know, I, it has never crossed my mind that some rather busy business uh, CEO would want to ask, what do your models teach me about what, how I should network? Uh, but, uh, but I think all, all I wanted to say was I think there is a sense in which this is a very practical problem. And there's a sense in which I think people actually engage in this. Uh, people have to go through this, and people do it all the time. And in a world where we are constantly forming online networks, I think it's become much more salient. It may have been something we were doing subconsciously or not quite with so much thought. Uh, but now we do it, I think, People must be doing it, right? They sent me all these link proposals all the time on LinkedIn. Right? So it must cost them at least some epsilon, right, to, to, to do this. So, uh, and, and there are people who never propose a link to me. And so, you know, there are people who obviously find this epsilon high. So, so um, I think that, yeah, this is a very roundabout way of saying that this, I think A, it's a rather interesting practical problem. Uh, and B, we don't have a good model. Uh, but I think, you know, if someone can write a good model, I think it would be a, it would be a major advance. So, um, I think some of some people in this room, maybe Arun is working actually on network formation models and structural work on that. Maybe you want to add, are you going to have a poster? Or, uh, my poster is in there. Yeah. No, do you want to say a little bit about network formation uh, models and uh, econometric work on that? Yeah.
Yes. Yes, so um, I should have mentioned that. So, okay, so let me just again sort of take again a step back into not a, within economics but outside economics. Uh, there is a very, very um, lively and very, um, very interesting, very high quality uh, group of people working on um, essentially large data sets or networks and trying to, you can call it uh, crudely, you can call it data mining, but essentially to do data mining with you know, millions of nodes and billions of links, you need to have, you need to be very clever. I mean, so let's put it this way. And so you need to have algorithms to figure out uh, patterns in this data. And more than that, you need to know what your, if you like, what kind of patterns would qualify as a community or would not qualify as a community. And so there is a large body of work, and the person, I think the best person to follow up on this is the work of Mark Newman. He's, um, uh, he's a, I think he's a computer scientist by training, or, but now he's more of a statistical physicist. He has a very nice um, large book on networks. A lot of it is devoted, in fact, to these kinds of things. How do you statistically, uh, using good algorithms, um, describe networks. Uh, and I would call that broadly in the data mining sort of field, but it's much more sophisticated, if you like. Data mining suggests something which is a bit crude and mindless, but if you meet Mark Newman for about five minutes, you, you will realize there's nothing mindless about him. And uh, it's very interesting work, but it's uh, very much you know, algorithms, and it's not axiomatic notions of communities, as economists might think of, but it's it's actually very interesting, very plausible, and makes sense, and has, you know, there are studies where there are correlations between these community structures and behavior, and, and so on. Okay, so, so, yeah. Sorry, you need to. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, I, okay. So, as I said, I think there's relatively. Um, so, I think you're touching upon a number of interesting issues, and they are a little outside what I would say are the main <laughs> points of interest in the economics literature. But having said that, I, I think there is a lot of interest in machine learning. I mean, I have friends who work on this, so, and I, you know, I'm aware of that work, but I didn't bring it up because economists have not been working on that. But having said that, of course, if you want to get into networks, you need to know what they are, and to, to know what they are, you might want to do some of, run some of this machine learning algorithms, so you may want to follow up on Mark Newman's work. And uh, increasingly, um, companies and governments are interested in analyzing networks and analyzing network data. And so all these different uh, method, you know, uh, methods and approaches are actually being used uh, increasingly. So. Okay, I think we are done. Thank you.